Thank you, Mr. President. I also rise to give my no vote explanation and point out some of the flaws, critical errors in this resolution. While this resolution seems to be predicated upon both the rights governed under the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and the rights of parents as those relate to the state's constitutional mandate of public education, as Article 8 provides, this is a case where a little bit of knowledge of some words can be dangerous because it is not accompanied by any measure of critical thinking. Even the Supreme Court, Justice Scalia, in fact, in 2000, and Troxel v. Granville, asserted that while parents may enjoy these fundamental rights, these fundamental rights cannot be construed as absolute rights. What this resolution is trying to do is conflate fundamental rights for overarching responsibility, care, upbringing, and education, educating of parents over their children for absolute rights. Lines six through nine of page one read, and I quote, parents are in the best position to know their own child's needs and circumstances, and therefore should maintain authority over all decisions that could impact the health and well-being of their children. This statement in SR 107 reflects the clear conflation between fundamental rights and absolute rights, because there are times when, as parents, we temporarily abdicate certain duties to another individual or institution best situated to handle those duties. Let me give you an example from medicine. If one of my kids is running, trips and skins their knee, I can clean the wound, put on antibiotic ointment or cream, apply a bandage, give hugs and kisses, and we can go on about our day. Now, if one of my kids is running, trips, and breaks their ankle, I have to get them to the medical professional who can handle this type of physical injury. But I still have to give consent for that professional to treat that child because of the fundamental right as the child's parent. What I'm not gonna do, though, is tell the x-ray technician how to operate the machinery or tell the doctor setting the bone how to put the cast on in the manner that I believe with my non-existent wisdom or misinformation that is my imagined sense of the correct way to do it because at some point in my existence I went down a rabbit hole of YouTube medical videos or binge watched old episodes of St. Elsewhere ER or Grey's Anatomy. This resolution is doing the equivalent of that analogy with education. It is trying to have parents supersede the professional charge of educators. So once again, this legislature is trying to devalue the teaching profession writ large. I mean, do you really want your cousin's best friend's husband who thinks the earth is flat to be influencing or directing the science or geography curriculum? Because that's the logical destination of where this resolution is trying to misguide us. What this resolution fails to understand and appreciate, and apparently an alarming number of people who aren't educators fail to understand and appreciate, is the tripartite student, educator, parent relationship that should be an inherent part of education. Our good friend from the 23rd District just referenced that. And it's exactly because of this tripartite relationship, no, partnership, that MCLs 380.10 and 380.1137 include this language, which is generously borrowed from on page one, line 10, through the first three words of page two, line one, and on page two, lines five through nine. Five through nine. It's this tripartite partnership to which, which these sections of the revised school code speak. The failure to understand and appreciate this important tripartite relationship, partnership, is made clear on page two, lines 24 through 25 of the resolution, which reads, and I quote, it is essential that parents' voices are respected and incorporated into the development of academic curricula. 
Parents who don't also happen to be educators don't develop curricula. And chances are, even if they are parents and educators, they're not developing the curricula for their own child unless that child also happens to be one of their students. In fact, most educators would likely tell you, were they actually asked, is that they welcome this tripartite partnership. And a modicum of deep reading, critical thinking, and thorough reasoning tells us that this does not mean that public schools should cater to the sometimes uninformed ideas about education or curriculum that might be held by every single individual parent. As an aside, it's also entirely cringeworthy that this document about the influence of parents and the curriculum is in the passive voice, which in itself should make one question the passage just referenced. And if you're not familiar with the difference between the passive and active voice, one probably doesn't belong anywhere near influencing or developing the ELA curriculum. Now let's go back a few lines though, because here's where things get really questionable. When it lines 10 through 15, it takes a hard right at 214 Massachusetts Avenue in Washington, D.C., with its interesting claims about radical politics and political indoctrin indoctrination and education happening across the country. The sheer irony of not realizing that the very acts of academic censorship and banning books, all out of fear of truth and accuracy, is exactly that. Ironic, too because this level of fervor and fear about parents' rights as they relate to public education is a historical refrain of a tune that this country has sung before. Remember that 14th Amendment that I began with? It's the same amendment that in May 1954 governed the Supreme Court decision in Brown v. the Board of Education, thus overturning the 1896 Plessy v. Ferguson decision. If that's unclear, one might not be the correct people deciding upon or influencing the social studies or U.S. history curricula. You see, after the Brown v. Board of Education decision and the efforts to implement public school desegregation, there was much well-documented outrage over it, stoked primarily by white parents, often using the conceptual framework of parents' rights as one of their nicer reasons. But ample historical footage, reports by journalists, and evidence from photojournalists of the day prove that at the core of the dissent was not simple parents' rights, but rather racism in itself. Cold, hardcore racism. A similar reaction occurred after the Green v. New Kent County SCOTUS decision in 1968 which also had effects not just in the South, but into northern cities. Today, this resurrected fever-pitched concern about parents' rights and guised as transparency in public education is directly related to the recent blatant attacks on public education through acts of academic censorship and banning books, primarily by or about people who are not white, not straight, or cisgender, and not necessarily Christian, out of a fear of truth and accuracy. Much like the massive resistance response in the South to Brown v. the Board of Education, today's updated response to public education, primarily by angry white suburban parents, has some ugly underpinnings, despite modulating the key, changing the tempo, and adding a bigotry expanding coda. And if that analogy was unclear, one probably has no business being anywhere near influencing the music education curriculum. Now, as our good friend from the 7th District referenced, I wonder why are we rehashing October 2021 in lines 17 through 22 of page 2? The legislative process happened. Live with it. Some folks are just mad because part of the legislature got a little tricky and tried to slip us a mickey with an attempt to appropriate funds for a literacy program that was basically a voucher program disguised as grants and thought nobody would notice or question its validity. By the way, as we've already heard, that is expressly prohibited in paragraph 2 of Article 8, Section 2 of the State Constitution, as our good friend from the 7th Senate District aptly discussed. 
I'm not going to read it. Because I'm going to hang on to the belief that everyone in here knows what it states since 38 of us took our oaths of office to uphold it. If that's not the case, get homework assignment might to be re become reacquainted with it. So to that end, I will not support or join in supporting a resolution that condemns the governor or any executive of the state of Michigan from doing the job of upholding the very constitution upon which we all took our oaths of office. That this resolution asks us to do so is beyond the pale. And on top of that, because apparently we needed just enough additional text to make the resolution get to three pages, as if in someone was trying to desperately make a rubric required page count, page three, lines one through four, repeat lines one through three of page one, even if a clever attempt to rearrange the words, which is just really bad form. So no, this whole resolution is a hot mess. And were one of my former college or university students to have turned this in as an assignment and expected a grade on it, let me tell you, the grade would have been below C level and been returned to them, heavily annotated, with margin notes and the suggestion to revise and resubmit if they expected a respectable grade. I will be voting no, and I urge members to also reject Senate Resolution 107 on the grounds that it offers a false and misleading premise of what parents' rights mean when it comes to public education as and is without merit.